Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos. And tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Knights Templars all the way up to modern day Satanism and a discussion on the history and origins of Baphomet. Baphomet, probably a statue, something of which you guys have seen before. It's now sort of the iconic symbol of, the, of uh, LaVey's Church of Satan. Of course, LaVey would say that they are, in fact, atheists and they don't believe in a deity, but we'll be getting into, in fact, some historical trajectory in which Baphomet was worshipped as a deity, and specifically a deity which brings opposites together. And we'll be looking at some texts. I'll be discussing, I'll be reading a bit from Eliphas Levi's book, The History of Magic, in which he discusses Baphomet and connects it back to ritualistic practices of the Knights Templars. Um, also, I'm not going to be reading anything, but another source which connects 
the Templars and Baphomet to Freemasonry is actually in this book, Alchemically Stoned by P.D. Newman, along with, of course, the famous book, Morals and Dogma by Alfred Pike. Um, he also has a section in here on Baphomet where he talks about him being the universal agent. The universal agent, of course, also in that book, you can find where he talks about Baal as the Lord. But I will be reading a section from this book, um, The Affluence of Deity. This is by a classicist that I've mentioned before, Carl A.P. Ruck. He's a classicist in which most of his scholarship has been in the promotion uh, or the discussions of entheogens, what they call them. So psychedelics, as you know, I have quite the previous background in the use of psychedelics. And I was a big fan of Carl A.P. Ruck's. Now I disagree with some of the things he promotes, but it's very interesting in this book, he'll talk about some of the practices of the Tem Templars, including urinating on the cross, spitting on the cross, um, various forms of male sodomy, uh, kissing the master's penis, in which they would have these sort of initiation rites. And so he talks a little bit about that, connecting it for him back to various psychedelic groups. So we're going to be covering a whole bunch of stuff. Again, I want to kind of play out and discuss the historical development. So we're not going to be talking so much about, as you guys know, the Capitol building in the state of Iowa had a display of Baphomet recently that a good hearted Christian rightfully destroyed. Um, and so obviously Baphomet is a character that is present within our culture. And also I do have an article, but we're not going to be reading it about after school satanic programs in various um, primary schools around the country. And so the one that I have, I think, is mentioning Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which also somebody mentioned in the comment section or the, the live chat here. So we will make reference to it. But also I have a little snippet of a global banker elite or was part of the elite who talked about how he was asked to participate in a form of satanic rituals and a child sacrifice and connecting it back to some of the satanic cults that we're going to be familiar with. And why that's important is because the Knights Templar, yes, they were part of the Crusades into the Holy Land, but more interesting, they in fact, um, they in fact are um, the bankers and so the Knights Templars had over 9,000 estates, 9,000 estates, and rightfully so, when they were persecuted during the Inquisition, uh, we're going to highlight how the Knights Templars actually moved from Southern Europe, Italy, Southern France, ironically, the same areas in which the Cathar heresies emerged, which I've done a lot of research and wrote an academic paper discussing the utilization of psychedelics as the Christian Eucharist. Uh, this is a practice that, of course, the Ca the Cathars, which I believe the Cathars were, that explains some of the research in the book, the Psychedelic Gospels by Jerry Brown. But um, the Templars, being these sort of money changers, had an immense amount of wealth, which is eventually confiscated around 1307. Uh, King Philip of France uh, most notably took most of that. And along with those properties. And so the Templars end up moving up to Scotland. And I have a little something I'm going to read to you guys about that. And that movement to Scotland leads into the development of what's called Scottish Freemasonry. And so Baphomet, as we know it, really gets going towards the 18th and 19th century, most notably with the Eliphas Levi, which of course is not his real name, but he, um, he, uh, really sort of developed the temporary iconography of Baphomet. Again, we typically see a goat-headed entity symbolizing the sabbatic goat, uh, both male and female, and all these different things which we're going to highlight here. So we're going to get into a whole bunch of historical stuff today. So please smash that like for everybody who's here. I greatly appreciate you all. And if you want to send in some support or some comments on the conversation today, feel free to do so. And please use the Streamlabs or the Dono chat link, which is in the video description, or YouTube if you prefer to use YouTube. Uh, that is good as well. So to begin with, Baphomet, as I said, it actually is a construction as a sort of idol or deity. Now, this is 
debated, and we're going to see as we move through some of these articles, um, the spiritual significance by most contemporary scholars have been dismissed, the, the idea that this is uh, explicitly related to Satanism or a sort of inversion of Christianity. But other scholars, most notably some of the historical scholars that we'll see from like the 17th, 18th century, did sort of imbue it with a spiritual significance. But what is Baphomet? Now, if you look into uh, the etymology it's kind of debated. Some people say it's sort of a bastardization or a corruption of Mahomet. And this was due to the Crusades. The theories abound that the Crusaders actually encountered various Arab tribes that had veneration of different icons, if you will, idols. But it was associated with Muhammad. And some, some people argue that this is a sort of corruption um, or a, a sort of corrupted transliteration of Mahomet re referring to Muhammad. However, I, I agree more with the people who associate it with the Greek origins of Baphe and Metis, which has to do with the baptism of wisdom. And this is where it's going to connect the Templars with many of the Gnostic cults that I've talked about in previous streams. Um, as I've talked about before, like the Carpocratians, uh, they had a Eucharist that had uh, menstruating blood on it, uh, fecal matter. Um, the, the Borberites participated in various forms of homosexual orgies or rituals. Um, and so Gnosticism is much larger than any specific one tradition, school, or group. As we've discussed before, there's a whole bunch of them. But Gnosticism is often characterized about this sort of goal of attaining spiritual knowledge, which would liberate you. And so Baphomet in Satanism is sort of built upon the premise that Satan or Lucifer is the true Prometheus. He is the true bringer of light. He is the true liberator. And this leads into sort of, in some versions, most often with occultism, is sort of the veneration of oneself as God. And we could argue that it's tied with a sort of accessing or a spiritual possession, allowing these entities to take one over in that process. But Baphe Metis to me makes more sense because they were practicing these very weird rituals, which I would consider a form of baptism of wisdom. And we're going to get into one author's belief that Baphomet is actually part of a sort of rearranging of letters tied with Hebrew and Greek, and it gets back to Sophia. So we begin to see this sort of Sophia figure, the veneration of wisdom, the veneration of spiritual knowledge. And so the Knights Templar, as I said, were accused of worshiping its statues of Baphomet, and they saw it as the bringing together of opposites. So we see in Baphomet man versus animal, uh, or man and animal, Man, uh, male and female, good and evil, is sort of the hermetic adage, as above, so below. This is where we see the, the pointing down and the pointing up, um, which, again, hermeticism has sort of infiltrated many different spiritual traditions and aspects. So I'm not saying hermeticism is satanic, but that cultural milieu of ideas certainly influences Baphomet worship and veneration. Um the father and mother. So Baphomet is considered the sort of mother of all in, in some interpretations. <clears throat> um, also terrestrial versus aerial. So we'll see that Baphomet is a goat headed entity with hooves, ungulate like feet, but also has wings. You see another sort of bringing together of opposites. And, and we have an article that will highlight how Satanism, but the utilization of Baphomet, you know, it, a lot of people appropriate it and use that symbol for different reasons. Sometimes it's for a, um, and this is the reason why the Church of Satan has put like a statue of Baphomet outside, I think, a government building in Arkansas because a gentleman put out the Ten Commandments. But also in the Capitol building of Iowa is it's supposed to sort of um, be a symbol that represents the separation of church and state so that Christianity doesn't have influence into the sort of secular governmental operations. Um, <clears throat> so, as I said, the Knights Templars are accused of a lot of different things in regards to these rituals associated with Baphomet. 
Um, we know for a fact that they were urinating and spitting on the cross during their initiation rituals. Um, Cross-dressing, we found remains of various Templars that were buried in, in women's dresses, uh, male figures. We see a sort of mock ritual resurrection, which is still actually common within Freemasonry. Of course, it's much more sanitized now. But that's my point, moving back to Albert Pike and P.D. Newman, is because most Masons would say that they are, in fact, the continuation of the Templar tradition, that this sort of Gnostic tradition of enlightenment. And so we see that the Templars were accused of doing initiation ritual in which the, ma the headmaster would take his pants off and the initiate would be forced to kiss his penis. And so we see a lot of sort of sexual um, degeneracy associated with this. And this is why I have an article highlighting how Baphomet, not just used in this sort of attack on, well, church and state and how we're going to use this symbol to make sure that they're separated, but also in regards to homosexuality and transgenderism, various sex aberrant sexual practices that Baphomet is certainly associated with that. And, and we can see that even the Templars, when they are beginning, often utilize this symbol for those purposes. So Baphomet represents a lot of different things. Um, and as I said, Albert Pike refers to Baphomet as the universal agent, the universal agent. And it is the God that embodies the dissolution of boundaries, something that I've talked to you about before and how masculinity, generally speaking, traditional masculinity is about the maintaining of boundaries, whether it be uh, the boundary of the nuclear family, of which the article we're going to be referencing actually highlights that Baphomet is really attack on the nuclear family. And we're going to look at Celine Dion's uh, clothing line for children, which is explicit references to, to Baphomet. And of course, we know about Balenciaga and their utilize, utilization of children and their sort of satanic symbolism as well. And this is a part and parcel of um, dis dissolving these boundaries between male and female, between correct sexual dynamics, between men and women, and creating traditional structured families. So this dissolution of boundaries, this is what we're seeing all over our culture right now. And as a traditional Orthodox Christian, obviously, I would say this is a sort of satanic inversion, that God created the world in an ordered way, the logos, and that certainly we can collapse dialectics, as I would argue the incarnation of the logos absolutely does in the mysticism of the Orthodox theology. But this one's a much more imminent, much more material sort of dissolving of all boundaries, getting back to, again, Baphomet representing this universal agent that once all the boundaries are dissolved, we're all going to be in a way submitting towards this Baphomet universal God. And so he is, as Levi refers to as Baphomet, is the sum total of the universe. He's the all things of the universe put together. And so the iconic symbolism that Eliphas Levi creates, this is what he was going for when he created that imagery and in in very, you know, utilizing various symbols. And also we see that the Templars and Baphomet worship, if you will, is often associated with the Ophites, another Gnostic group, this one coming out of Egypt, which venerated serpents. And so for Elias Levi, he used like the caduceus of Hermes during like it's usually placed during the stomach and we see the serpent moving up the caduceus. Um, but we know the Ophites, for example, was another Gnostic group, and they venerated snakes. They would have to kiss snakes. They would have the snake lick the Eucharistic bread whenever they would perform their rituals, and that the Templars have many commonalities and many influences on these groups. And so I argued in one of my papers, um, my academic papers, is that the Templars, when they went to the Holy Land during the Crusades, they absolutely came in contact with various Gnostic groups. And this is the same argument that Carl A.P. A. P. Ruck makes in this book, which I want to read a section to you guys here in just a bit. And so after the Inquisition, these Templars, their ritualistic belief structure, their spirituality, this was persecuted by the Catholic Church and most notably the King of France during the Inquisition. And once they killed the leader of the Templars right around 1307, uh, they fled and they went up to Scotland and, and just a few years later, uh, we'll look up the timeline here in just a few. We see 
that the Scottish Rite Freemasonry began to exist. And so let me pull up this little article here since we're on this historical subject and just read a little bit of what I wrote regarding this. So um, right here, this is just a section. We're not going to read the whole paper. In fact, I have it up um, on YouTube if you guys want to actually read this paper. But talking about a, a Carl Ruck right here, the classicist, Ruck also addresses the possibility of crusading groups such as the Knights Templar and Knights Hospitallers encountering these living ancient practices within the Holy Land. This claim is supported by medieval scholars Walter L. Wakefield and Jeffrey Burton Russell, which they have sort of the ultimate book on heresies of the Middle Ages. This is this book right here. Um, for those of you who want to see that, it, it's kind of an expensive book, but it is really good if you're looking at various Christian heresies during the Middle Ages. Now, it's mostly oriented around Western Europe. So as Orthodox, there's not a whole lot of mention in regards to um, some of the Orthodox encounters with these Gnostic groups, such as the Paulicians in Armenia or the Tondrakians in Armenia. Um, but anyways, moving forward here, um, Russell notes that during the medieval period, there was a significant Catholic suspicion surrounding the origins of the Templars' magical oriental heresies. Combine this with the fact that Manichaean Gnostic heresies common to Eastern sects, such as the Paulicians or the Bogomils, Bogomils come from Bulgaria, and we have historical evidence that the Bogomils were participating in sort of inebri inebriating rituals using psychedelic mushrooms, reappear in Western Europe by way of Catharism around the same time of the returning Crusades. And again, that comes from that book on medieval heresies. Wakefield argues there is convincing evidence that the Bogomils of Bulgaria and Constantinople were closely connected with the Cathars of Western Europe. In addition, it is worth noting that pre-Christian Bulgaria, as I said, had archaic mushroom monuments. Could these ancient practices have been? Okay, hold on. I want to move now to, there's another section here. Okay, here we go. So we're skipping, skipping, skipping. This is talking a little bit about Armenia, the use of these psychedelics, Mithraic rituals, all this type of stuff. And so we come down here, and due to the Inquisition, many Gnostic and Manichaean cults began to be quelled and persecuted. This included not only the Cathars, but also the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were, quote, accused of urinating on the crucifix and obscene sexual rituals of initiation a practice consistent with other Gnostic sects. The grave of the Templar found in Germany contained the same Ophite talismanic seal related to those Gnostics who had previously venerated serpents. Uh, by 1413, Templar leaders were executed, forcing many to the north where they fled primarily to Scotland, where their tradition survived in Freemasonry. In works such as Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, as well as P.D. Newman's Alchemically Stone, The Psychedelic Secret of Freemasonry, Freemasons have claimed a direct lineage with not only the Templars, but one going back to Eleusis itself. This has to do with the Eleusinian mysteries, the sort of mystery of Persephone, her going to Hades and reemerging, where we know, well, it's at least speculated by somebody like Albert Hoffman, the gentleman who at the Sandoz Labs synthesized LSD from various forms of ergot. Um, um, we have Wasson. Carl Ruck and Hoffman basically wrote a book arguing that the inebriating substance of the Alicinian mysteries was a form of like erg ergotized smut. And so we know that Plato and sort of the who's who of the ancient classical world participated in the Alicinian mysteries. So that's what that reference is to Eleusis itself. The hermaphroditic god Baphomet, whom the Templars are purported to have worshipped, was believed by Joseph von Hammer Pergstall, who we're going to be reading a little bit of his stuff today, to be a secret Ophite Gnostic initiation ritual. Baphomet, and this is where I argue, and many Southers do, but a lot of the more normie articles that I read, they all refer back to Mahomet. Um, and we can see that, and I'll pull up the, the official etymology refers to Baphomet being a bastardization of Mahomet. But I would argue that Baphomet comes from the Greek Baphe and Metis, which together is a baptism of wisdom or a baptism of Sophia. Could this wisdom be the ancient psychedelic mystery rite of death and rebirth? Could this be why Wolfham von Eschenbrock referred to the Knights of the Holy Grail as baptized men? 
whether or not uh, Baphomet was a literal god worshipped or the name of an esoteric Gnostic initiation isn't of interest here. What is important is that according to Freemasonry, the Scottish York Rite comes directly from those Knights Templar who fled southern Europe for safe harbor in Scotland. Newman even writes that they were the psychedelic guardians of the authentic Grail tradition. Is it any coincidence then that the 15th century Rosalind Chapel, the Scottish chapel where Jerry and Julie Brown identified anatomically correct Amanita muscaria mushrooms in the forehead of the green men, has a direct connection back to crusading Templar knights? Robert the Brute, Robert the Brutes, King of the Scots, appears to have been a Templar sympathizer and was ruling Scotland at the same time. Templars were being executed during the Inquisition. He even went so far as to wanting his embalmed heart to accompany a crusade and be buried in the Holy Land of Jerusalem. Sir William Sinclair, who is described to have been a Templar, fought with Robert the Bruce during the Battle of uh, Bannon Cockburn for Scottish independence. 150 years later, Sir William, his descendant, built Roslyn Chapel near Edinburgh. And so his ancestor, Henry St. Clair, first Earl of Roslyn, had served on the First Crusade with Hogue de Payen, first Grand Master of the Knights Templar, and Hogue visited Rosalind in 1126, where he was given the land where the chapel now stands. It is claimed and also denied that the Rosalind is replete with Masonic and Templar symbolism built on the plan of Herod's temple. The Sinclairs even claim that they are the lineage of Jesus through his mystical marriage of Mary Magdalene. Of course, we know that's a sort of Gnostic trope that Jesus Christ actually had a secret sexual love affair with Mary of Magdalene. No, of course, as Orthodox Christians, we reject all this stuff. This is um, later developments due to these Gnostic groups. The Sinclair clan even claim a blood relationship with Jesus through the infamous Gnostic marriage with Mary Magdalene, providing more probability was Gnostic and Manichaean heresies, be it with crusading knights or the Cathars that preserve the esoteric mystery of these ancient religions. So, Anyways, uh, we don't have to go too much further with this. The point isn't to read this paper, but we're going to be referencing. And so we get a, an understanding of Baphomet as we understand it as this sort of amalgamation of opposites really gets going through the veneration of these Knights Templars. And what I think is so interesting about it is, as I said, the Knights Templars are associated with a sort of financier class and that they had tons of and tons of money. It was an incredibly wealthy group. And when we think about some of the global elitists that are operating today, we often think about the central bank. And I can't help but think that maybe these satanic practices in reference to Baphomet aren't continued by many of the banking elite, of which we have an insider whistleblower who claims that he was a banking elite and he was sort of asked to participate in these rituals which he neglected and we'll bring that up here in a few so so baphomet is the satanic merging of opposites we see in the u.s and around the world happening today the sort of transgender movement where we believe men can get pregnant and women have testicular cancer this is a dissolution of boundaries this is a dissolution of the cognitive categories to think clearly and we, of course we know that Satan is the bringer of chaos. And this is very different from our understanding of logos, right? So for those who venerate Baphomet, they see good and evil as sort of necessary opposites, a very dualistic framework that is then brought together in a single figure where very different from an orthodox framework where we believe evil is the privation of God's uncreated energies. And so, as I've said before, just like the law of thermodynamics, when we talk about a spectrum of something cold and hot, we're really just talking about a single thermodynamic energy. We're talking about energy, and cold is a term we use to reference the privation of that energy, and therefore cold doesn't really exist in the sense that it has a positive ontological existence. It's a term used to describe the absence of thermodynamic energy. In the same way, that's how orthodoxy understands evil and everything that's the opposite of truth, love, beauty, logic, reason, mercy, compassion, honor, glory. These are energetic realities that you and I, as being made in the image of God, try to embody and express towards each other 
being Christ-like in that we then participate in the divinizing process of theosis. Now, obviously, Western Christianity doesn't have that same emphasis on theosis, but my point is to bring up the different understandings of how good and evil relate to each other, because understanding that good and evil are sort of necessities, and therefore Baphomet or Satan is both the god of good and evil, or Lucifer, however they want to frame it, this is essential to their sort of theological framework that they're working from. And so bringing together opposites, as we see right now, testosterone rates in men are at all time low. And we see that women are obviously, this is part of the whole manosphere red pill movement, talking about the sort of masculine qualities women are embodying because traditional masculinity and traditional femininity is often tied to a celebration of the nuclear family and having children, not just the nuclear, the extended family as well. Somebody got on me one Obviously, grandparents, cousins, uncles, all this different stuff, but life and its um, trajectory is necessary for men and women occupying specific roles. And in that sort of mystical union, the again, marriage being a sacrament in the Orthodox Church, we don't want to dissolve. I don't want to become a woman to become like God or participate in a divine reality. I marry another woman who's made in the image of God, and we submit to each other through a form of self-martyrdom, that I'm going to serve her and she's going to serve me. And then through this mystical union under the aegis of Christ and the Trinity, we can move towards the heavenly kingdom. So Satan for them is, I said, the liberator, the light bringer, a sort of Promethean figure for these types of people in this general theology that we're discussing today. And I would believe, and we've kind of talked about, and I want to do a stream specifically on aliens. And Jay, shout out to Jay Dyer. He did a great stream last night talking about the elite's plan and the you know aliens, which I firmly believe to be demonic entities. And this is something that Tucker Carlson has recently spoke out about, that aliens are one of the topics he doesn't like to discuss publicly because he doesn't have hard, fast proof evidence. But according to the people he's talk to that are sort of insiders is that these entities that are referred to as aliens have always been here. And he, and he kind of, you know, was uh, very amorphous about what he was trying to say, but they're demons. They're demonic entities that have always been here and that aliens or our various elites contacting these entities. It's not about anybody's coming here from Andrade Andromeda or, you know, Palladian spaceships. No, this is about a spiritual warfare that's on this planet. And I believe that aliens are going to be used to bring forth the one world government because one, they tell us to, or one, they're a threat and we need to submit to them one way or another. So the goal of the worship of the evil one and to become God through this sort of apotheosis as, a, as opposed to theosis, I think is a form of demonic possession. And that, as I said, I, I, before I became Orthodox, I did a few magic rituals, particularly sigil magic. And I saw that this stuff is absolutely real. But if it's real that you can perform various magic rituals to get things that you want, what's not discussed is the energetic transference of your soul. Because yeah, they'll give you money. They'll give you wealth. They'll give you fame. They'll give you power, whatever it is that you want on the side of eternity. But what you exchange is the image of God. What you exchange is your soul. And that's something you can never get back. And so I firmly believe that people do, in a way, sell their soul to the devil because this is all, in my worldview, a spiritual reality. So spiritual possession, then, is why it's not about everybody being on a grand plan, right, where they kind of criticize conspiracy theorists and all this different stuff. No, it's that it's a spiritual reality. And so if you're not moving towards the one true God, the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, well, then you're going to be part of this other plan. And so it's not like people need to be uh, CC'd in on the globalist email. It's that naturally their predispositions towards various phenomenon in the world is moving towards ultimately the kingdom of the Antichrist. And so Satanism and Luciferianism is spreading around our culture, most notably, but around the world. And it's all about the inversion of our Christian worldview, our Christian paradigm. So this is all to sort of set the basis for today's conversation. 
So guys, if you're here, smash that like. We're going to be getting into the sort of nitty gritty here. Um, God bless you all. I wish you all a happy new year. We're getting ready to move into 2024. I wish you guys and your families the absolute best. And I want to thank all of you for your support for the year of 2023. Everybody who's here, I greatly, greatly appreciate you. I truly love you guys. Thank you so much for giving me the ability to do my research and make these videos. I feel indebted to you, and I thank you very, very much. And so before we go any further, let's take care of a little bit of house cleaning. And I want to say, um, if anybody wants to support my work, one of the best things you can do is become a website member. And you can sign up at the website. Um, oh, where is... Uh, there we go. Um, you can sign up at the website at davidpatrickherry.com forward slash register. And there you will be able to, well, if my internet would work, come on. There we go. Uh, you can become a website member of which I got tons of exclusive video content up there. We just did another video on why the future doesn't need us. This really great article from April of 2000 by a gentleman named Bill Joy in a way not really, but in a way, sort of whistleblowing on the future that was to come in regards to robotics, nanotechnology, advanced artificial intelligence, ge genetic engineering. And in a way, it's 2023. He wrote this article 23 years ago, and we kind of live in the world that he was afraid of. So um, that is over there for members, and that is right here. So uh, let me go back. So if you guys want to check all this stuff out, we got a whole litany of videos there. So for $5 a month, you can access to that. Of course, we also have a fitness membership and a premium membership of which we do two exclusive private Zoom meetings every single month. And with the premium membership, you get both the fitness and the logo subscription. So if you want to support, please do so that way. Also, if anybody's interested in signing up for a one-on-one -on -one session where we get into a private Zoom meeting, just me and you, and we can talk about any topic that your heart desires, be it theology, be it philosophy, be it the history of magic, whatever it be, Western esotericism, uh, bodybuilding, whatever you want to talk about, you can do so there. So please sign up if that's something you'd be interested in. And also, if you guys want to sponsor a stream, I've been working on some research for Freemasonry and the sort of revolutionary spirit, looking at the Bolshevik Revolution, the French Revolution, and the American Revolution, and how, ironically, all three have a sort of central Freemasonic element. So we're going to be talking about that um, in a recent sponsored stream. And then we got two from AC that I'll be doing. And so if you have a sponsored stream you would like for me to do, you can use that link right there and purchase. So thank you very much for that. And also, if anybody's in the market for some Orthodox icons, uh, prayer robes, incense, anything like that, go check out this great American Orthodox company, orthodoxdepot.com. Use promo code CODAL. You'll get 10% off and you'll help me out and you'll get some good products. So make sure if you are looking for anything, go check out orthodoxdepot.com. All right. Okay, now with that being said, smash that like for everybody who's here. And if you want to show some support, feel free to send in a super chat here on YouTube. Uh, would love for somebody to give some memberships today. This is the season of giving after all. And if you want to show some support, send in a super chat using the Streamlabs or the Dono Chat link. So let me just make sure. Uh, so we got. Uh, five dollar. Oh, we got ten dollars comes in on the dono chat from Blue Skittle, and he says Satan has so much soy, he grew breast. Common Satan L. <laughs> it's true, right? It's true, and that's why they want you to turn into a soy boy with bitch tits, so you can be just like Baphomet as well. And so we see that one of the things that this sort of these sort of Baphomet spirituality or Satanism. It's all about a sort of feminization of the masculine because strong men that worship the Trinity are the ultimate threat to the system, are the ultimate threat because we worship the kingdom. We worship the one true God. And of course, they always wanted to feminize us and, can, and turn us into something that we're not created to be. Also, Kristen, shout out to Kristen. She throws in $5 and says, we'll be seeing a candlelight rendition of Vivaldi's Four Seasons at the Scottish Rite Cathedral Masonic Center in a couple weeks. Pray for us. 
So sad, such a lovely event has to be tainted by my knowledge of the history involved here. <laughs> yeah, I know. And if I understand if this is the Kristen who I believe it is, um, she's also a fellow Hoosier. And so the Scottish Rite Cathedral, Masonic Cathedral in downtown Indianapolis, it's a really, really beautiful building right downtown uh, Indianapolis, just north of the circle there. So, um, yeah, sorry that you have to go there. I'm sure it's going to be lovely. And, and seeing Vivaldi's Four Seasons, I'm sure will be glorious. So thank you very much, Kristen, for your super chat. God bless you and the family. I wish you guys the absolute best. And we got $2 over here on YouTube. Uh, we're supposed to be humble and learn. Throws in $2 and says, Ark of Baphomet is a book worth reading. Okay, Ark of Baphomet. Well, if it's the one by James True, I'm not too interested in that. Just knowing who James True is and the level of his um, research and some of his ideas. But I'll check out uh, and look into what exactly the Ark of Baphomet is. So thank you very much. We're supposed to be humble and learn. Appreciate your $2 super chat. Thank you. And Marshall Law throws in $5 and says, what do you make of the claim that some of the rights Templars committed were gathered via torture, making them untrustworthy. Is there any truth to it? Yeah, well, that's sort of the speculation by many scholars is that, of course, um, the veneration and the worship of Baphomet is came out due to many Templars being tortured during the Inquisition. But um, I think there's a bit of a black and white problem when we look at the Inquisition regarding witchcraft or regarding the Templars. You know, I have another book over there that's uh, on, it's a, is by a Harvard scholar um, on medieval witchcraft. And it talks a lot about the Inquisition. And he highlights that even though some of them may be uh, exaggerated, there's certainly historical evidence for witches being a part of sort of ritualistic abortions, uh, various orgiastic sexual practices, and stuff like that. So, um, where do we draw the line? It's kind of difficult. Um, is everything that comes out from people that were being tortured during the Inquisition false? I, again, I don't know. It wasn't there. Hard to tell. However, the point with the Templars is that we have a historical precedent with the Gnostics. As I said, we have stuff about the Borberites and the Carpocratians and the Ophites and the Simonians, you know, Simon Magus, his Gnostic group that got going. Of course, Simony is the heresy that's discussed in the book of Acts when Simon Magus, the great magician, wanted to purchase his baptism so he would have the power of the Holy Spirit because he saw the apostles healing people and stuff through, again, the mystery and power of the Holy Spirit. And he wanted that and he wanted to pay for it. That is a heresy within the Orthodox Church called simony. Well, the Simonians, that particular Gnostic group, we know that the married women would still have to participate in these sort of sexual favors with whoever the headmaster of their Gnostic group was. I only mention that because we have historical evidence of these Gnostic groups participating in rituals that the Templars themselves are accused of, and we have significant historical evidence to tie the Ophite Gnostic tradition with various aspects of the Knights Templars. So how credible is every claim? Well, I kind of take a middle ground because many contemporary scholars will say, oh, well, all that stuff is just garbage. It was totally over-exaggerated. Um, Maybe so, maybe so, but I speculate it's not. I speculate that there is real evidence there. And again, if you look at the morals and dogma, you look at many of the Masons who talk about there being the continuation of the Templars. Well, they explicitly are stating that many of their ritual practices come from that which was being done by the Templars. So we'd certainly know, um, that they had a sort of veneration of this Baphomet structure, idol, however you want to say it. Some people have been apologetic and saying that this was about um, spitting on the cross and peeing on the cross was a form of actually uh, these Christians were were talking about or, or sort of symbolically representing what it was like to be a Christian in the Holy Land and sort of sympathizing with Christ and that they were sort of united with him in their heart. I find that a bit hard to believe that any sort of faithful Christian, be it Catholic, Orthodox, I mean, that was all that existed at that point, 
that they would urinate and spit on the cross to sympathize with how they were treated and in their heart be united with Christ. I find that one hard to believe. So you make a good point, martial law, um, but we just don't, you know, it depends on how you approach it. Obviously, I'm coming at this topic as an Orthodox Christian, and I believe that it is all spiritually connected. And so I personally believe that there is a spiritual connection with the Baphomet worship of the Templars and probably central banking in the contemporary world. That, as I do believe, that we're run by a global elite that participates in a sort of satanic inverted ritualistic practices. And it's probably tied to Epstein Island and child sacrifice and all this different stuff. And, you know, we have a whistleblower today that we're going to highlight uh, from the Netherlands, but maybe he's lying. Who knows? So it's, again, it depends on where you come from. It's a debated topic. So thank you very much, um, Marshall, for that. I really appreciate it. And also we had some uh, super chats come in over on the stream labs. Let me bring up those as well before we go any further. Um, Levy throws in $10. Well, thank you very much, Levy, for the $10 super chat. No comment. God bless you. Wish you the best. And BMX 1966 throws in $10 as well. Thank you very much, brother. I really appreciate all your support. You've been, uh, you've been faithful to, to the streams and constantly supporting my work. Thank you very much, BMX 1966. God bless you and your family as well. And happy new years to you guys. So, uh, let me just double check, make sure that we're up to speed on all the super chats before we go any further here. It looks like we are. Okay, so now um, let's get into some of the articles that I wanted to read today. And actually, let's read a few of the, the sections here. So Carl A.P. Ruck here, um, let me just highlight that he is somebody who's actually uh, promoting the idea of the ancient inebriating use of psychedelics. And he's trying to, in his work, connect it to the Templars and the Gnostics as a continuation of this ancient practice, because from his perspective, the Christian church, both Orthodox and Catholic, were trying to um, suppress the ancient roots of these practices going all the way back to Eleusis. And so I don't disagree with him. I think the Catholic and the Orthodox Church were trying to suppress these, these practices, but that doesn't mean they're good. That doesn't mean they're the true origin of Christianity and, um, and so forth. So let me just read this little section here to you guys. So, so he says something true. If you have this book, it's called The Affluence of Deity, um, Alchemy and Psychoactive Sac Sacraments in the Medieval and Renaissance Art. Um, he says, something true may also lurk among the many false allegations made against the Knights Templar. As Christian Knights, they obviously celebrated the Eucharist, although he highlights here that the Eucharist was indeed um, uh, psychedelic. So that's not very uh, traditionally oriented, especially due to our understandings of inebriation and trying to avoid that. But it was common to accuse one's enemies of perverting the mass to Satanism. And so he says... Um, Poor fellow soldiers of Christ who hazard their ways to defend the Holy Land in the pilgrims, their presumed deity was named Baphomet, a word that was often disclosed under, uh, under the Inquisition, presumably indicating their conversion to Muhammad. More, pro more probably, a pejorative corruption of the Islamic prophet's name with the Baptist. Images that survive on Templar artifacts from the 13th century depict a a uh, presumed satanic deity, a hermaphroditic, and replete with alchemical symbolism of a lunar and solar conjunction, not unlike the depictions of the um, leontophallic or lion-headed god who presides over the end of time in Mithraism. The emblem, probably with special significance, occurs on their chalice. And so he's connecting these sort of Gnostic traditions with Mithraism, which he then claims that Christianity is basically building upon Mithraism, right? That sort of popular um, zeitgeist trope, right? And so many things can be true at once. Uh, Christianity, first of all, the whole thing about worshiping on the winter solstice, December 25th, because we worship the sun. It's funny because on the Julian calendar, which again, all the Slavic churches and historically the, the Orthodox church until they converted to the new calendar, uh, Christmas was on like January 7th. So that isn't even the case, but certainly the Western church, the Catholic church, 
did utilize a pagan holiday of the solar or the yeah the winter solstice to accommodate and promote the understanding of the birth of light itself god incarnate and so both things can be true and just because they build upon various pagan elements one doesn't make all paganism wrong uh that's called the genetic fallacy and so as orthodox with our theology of the logos spermaticos truth can be found in many different places Okay, so yeah, true things could be said by Plato and Aristotle, of which some people have claimed, like St. Justin Martyr, who developed the Logos per Spermaticos understanding, is that, well, seeds of Logos Spermaticos can be all over the place. And so anytime we see, well, the, you know, this God, uh, Apollo, you know, he, he does this and Mithra does that. And that's just like Jesus Christ. And that's where they came from. Well, not exactly. That's a weak argument. Because we're actually claiming a historical literality to our God. But any, anyways, I digress. I digress. So in regards to talking about these Templars, he says they were accused of peeing on the cross, which is easily seen as a pejorative reference. Um, and he ties the use of urine to, again, various psychedelic rituals, because those of you who are going to be familiar with like Siberian shamanism, for example, Siberian shamanism most notably utilized the Amanita muscaria mushroom, the famous red and white mushroom. And when they would eat that mushroom, first of all, it's kind of tied to aspects of pagan elements of Christmas as well, where you they would pull these trees because they they are underneath various uh, uh, conifer trees, so like uh, birch and pine. And so they would put these mushrooms on the tree to dry out. Then they would consume the sort of dry so that the muscomol was sort of out of it, the, the toxin. They would eat the mushroom. They would get inebriated. And of course, reindeer are known for eating Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Could be this is why reindeers fly. Santa's reindeers fly. Many people have speculated. And that the shamans, it was known that they would drink their urine because when you eat the Amanita muscaria mushroom, it is toxic. And therefore, it's actually a better high, not that I've ever tried this, it's a better high the second time through because it's already been filtered. So he's claiming and tying in the utilization of urine back to psychedelics. That's his angle right there. But uh, worse, however, they were accused of being naked and then raised up as if they were from the dead to kiss the master obscenely on his private parts. The resurrection from the prone dead position is still practiced symbolically among the Masons, and its more extreme version is documented from archaeological remains within Mithraic cults. Male sexual hazing, moreover, is common in initiatory rituals, and it is likely that this too, if it occurred, reflects the survival of Mithraism, in which I agreed with him. This is where I talked a lot. I did a whole stream on um solving the Soma mystery, Soma being the ancient Vedic god, tying to Mithraism, because Mithra is in the Vedas, if you're not aware. And so these Mithraic cults, whether it be ancient Persia or Armenia, were utilizing the Amanita muscaria mushroom for ritualistic purposes. So I agree that Mithraism is tied towards the use of drugs and all this different stuff. But we're going to stop there on this book. My only point is that people who have a totally antagonistic worldview to mine both agree about some of these historical elements. And so um, let me pull up then uh, our articles here. Okay, right here. Let me pull this up. Um, looks like we had a super chat come in. Um, my tech 23 throws in five dollars and says i came to the temple and asked them you drink scotch right and they replied to a degree <laughs> all right thank you my tech 23 for the dad jokes i do appreciate that um i do appreciate that i feel like willie jenkins here uh you're giving him a run for his money so thank you for that do appreciate and it looks like we had another super chat come in over on the Streamlabs. Let me pull that up real quick. It's our brother, Will Emanuel. Uh, Will Emanuel throws in $10 and says, uh, we'll have to watch later. Thanks for all the work. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you, Will Emanuel. God bless you, brother, and thank you for the support. Do appreciate it. Uh, and blessings to you and your family. Okay. 
now let's continue on. Let's pull this back up. So here I pull into the you know online etymological dictionary to put in Baphomet. I wanted to see if Bapha, Baphe and Metis would come up. Of course it doesn't. And so it says it's the name of the idol which the Templars were accused of worshiping, regarded as a corruption of Mahomet, Muhammad, a name which took strange shapes in the Middle Ages. And so here we see it's tied to Muhammad. But I thought this was really interesting in regards to the use of Baphomet. And so we see, as I said, it's the 19th century where Baphomet really gets going. And we see that true here. So uh, much more prominent use. And then right around the satanic panic of the 1980s in America, we see Baphomet becoming more and more and more common. So I thought that little graph was pretty interesting in regards to the trends of Baphomet. And of course, Aleister Crowley, the founder of Thelema and the Thelemic Temple, he referred to himself as Baphomet. That was the name that he took. So a little interesting tidbit there. Um, here is an article that I thought we could read again. Unfortunately, my thumbnail, shout out to my thumbnail guy. Um, he used an image of Baphomet with ram's horns instead of goat horns. You can see if you check out the thumbnail, this is goat horns. He used one with ram horns and the ram horns actually come from so you can see the the goat horns here but if you go down to the devil in um in the tarot here we go you'll see that the devil in the tarot does in fact have ram horns as well so it's not totally off um but just wanted to highlight that so there's a few things here i'm going to use the the wikipedia for obviously not that it's very reliable we know it's a cia front but it has some great block quotes from different historical perspectives here that it, it just makes it a little bit easier. So here is one of the articles I want to read about. This is the history of Baphomet. And this was written in 2020. Um, and this one probably, as I've already looked it at, it doesn't take the spiritual significance of this stuff quite as literally as you and I would as believing Christians, but it's a good article nonetheless. But even before we get to that, let's go back to some of this, because I, I want to continue on with a lot of these historical elements. So even here, it talks about a deity which the Knight Templars were accused of worshiping that subsequently became incorporated in various occult and Western esoteric traditions, uh, yada, yada, yada. It first came into popular English usage in the 19th century during a debate and speculation on the reasons for the suppression of the Templar order. Baphomet is a symbol of balance in various occult and mystical traditions, the origin of which some occultists have attempted to link with the Gnostics and Templars. I think there's considerable evidence there, especially again, the Ophite tradition with the Gnosticism, though occasionally purported to be a deity or a demon. Uh, in fact, it is. Since 1856, the name Baphomet has been associated with the Sabbatic goat image drawn by Eliaphas Levi, which I have a section here by Levi. Let me read that to you real quick. It's specifically on Baphomet. And so this is also talking about the Templars. And so here's Eliaphas Levi. For those of you who don't know, he was a famous occultist. Uh, this is what he looked like here. Um, and so initially pursuing an ecclesiastical career in the Catholic church, he abandoned the priesthood in the mid twenties and became a ceremonial magician. At the age of 40, he began professing knowledge of the occult and wrote over 20 books on magic, Kabbalah, alchemical studies, and occultism. This is, that's why I, this is his book on the history of magic here. And so, um, let me just read a section of his talking about Baphomet and the Templars. He says the Templars had two doctrines. One was concealed and reserved to the leaders, being that of uh, Johannism, and the other was public, being Roman Catholic doctrine. Now, again, I'm very skeptical of this guy and some of his stuff, but I just, for the purpose of the stream, let's hear what Elias Levi had to say about Baphomet and the Templars. They deceived in this manner the enemies that they hoped to supplant. The Johannism of the adepts was the Kabbalah of the Gnostics. So, if it's the cabal of the Gnostics, then it's not the true church because the apostles certainly weren't a part of that. But it degenerated speedily into a mystic pantheonism carried even to idolatry of nature and hatred of all relevant dogma. For their better success and in order to secure partisans, uh, they fostered the regrets of every fallen worship and the hopes of every new cultist promising to all liberty of conscience and a new orthodoxy, which should be the synthesis of all persecuted beliefs. So Baphomet, as he's talking about in the Templars, we're trying to bring about 
all persecuted beliefs into a single structure. Again, persecuted due to the church. They went so far as to recognize the pantheistic symbolism of the grand masters of black magic and the better to isolate themselves from obedience to religion by which they were condemned beforehand. They rendered divine honors to the monstrous idol Baphomet. Even as, an, as of old, the dissenting tribes had adored the golden calf of Dan and Bethel. Now, the golden calf of Dan, of course, we know as orthodox christians that our tradition teaches us that the antichrist comes from the tribe of dan so i thought that was a little interesting thing there because we believe that the tribe of dan is going to be influential in regards to the bringing about the one world figure the antichrist and all that different stuff okay moving on certain monuments of recent discovery and certain precious documents belonging to the 13th century offer abundant proof of all that is advanced here so he's claiming, no, the Templars absolutely worshiped Baphomet, and their worship was an amalgamation of all persecuted belief systems. Okay. Other evidences are concealed in the annals and beneath the symbols of occult masonry. With the seeds of death sown in, in its very principle and in, in anarchic because of its it was heretical, the Order of Knights of the Temple had conceived a great work which it was incapable of executing because it understood neither humility nor personal abnegation. For the rest, the Templars, being the, in most cases without education and capable only of wielding the sword successfully, uh, possessed no qualification for overruling or for binding at the need of the queen of the world called public opinion. Okay, whatever. Now, he doesn't even mention about how the Knights Templars were the money changers, and had an acquired immense amount of wealth. As I said, they owned over like 9,000 estates in Southern Europe, Western Europe. So anyways, okay, you get the point. Moving back. Okay, so compared binary element symbolism of the equilibrium of opposites, half human, half animal, male, female, good and evil. Levi's intention was to symbolize his concept of balance with Baphomet representing the goal of perfect social order. So this is what Eliphas Levi depicted so he came up with this um so we see sort of alchemical coagula solve we see female breast on a male goaded figure animal man pentagram the torch again he's the light bringer we see the sort of promethean symbol as above so below black moon white moon um has has hooved feet ungulate animal but then also um has wings he's aerial and terrestrial at the same time so this is what they meant by sort of bringing together of opposites now i've already given you most of this stuff here but what i want to read is various d historical descriptions of baphomet and just move through here real quick so the indictment published by the court of rome set forth this is by Jules michelet history of france 1860 page 375 that in all the provinces, they had idols, that is to say heads, some of which had three faces, others but one. Sometimes it was a human skull. And of course, we're going to see the human skull. For example, this is a woman promoting, um, this is a satanic temple of Seattle, founder Lilith Star. You see the human skull. What That, that is actually tied back to some of these historical ritualistic practices and this comes from an article just talking about after school satan clubs that are being put into kids grade school primary school education and so why are they holding the human skull well obviously in orthodoxy we have human skulls anybody who's seen images of mount athos and various monasteries but it's again just because one symbol is used one way doesn't mean it's true for all things this is the problem with people that take an overly symbolic approach is that they come to a conclusion that one symbol means X, Y, Z, and therefore any depiction of that symbol means X, Y, Z. Well, not the case. Everything has a context. So in the Orthodox Church, ours is about the memory, the fact that we are going to die. Anyways, I just wanted to bring that up. So in their assemblies, and especially in their grand chapters, they worship the idol as a god, as their savior, saying that this head could save them, that it bestowed on the order all its wealth, made the trees flower and the plants of the earth sprout forth. Now, what I find really interesting, because there's another, um, I don't know if it's going to be in here, but, uh, oh yeah, here it is. It is this, this head is your God and your Mahomet. So this idea of this veneration of the head, 
again, to me, associates itself with this sort of Gnostic spirituality of sort of the rap rational apprehension of knowledge and that we're going to be liberated through our spiritual knowledge. And this is where we've talked about transhumanism as well. And transhumanism having, again, this idea that you're just your brain structures and if they can totally map your neuronal activity in your brain, well, then we know exactly who you are and you can be uploaded into a computer or you can be transferred into a robotic body or all this different stuff. It's that basically you're just your head. And I couldn't help, I'm not saying it's explicit or anything like that, but I couldn't help but notice many of these historical references to worshiping the head of Baphomet or worshiping a human skull. So anyways, moving forward, here's another one. This one by Thomas Wright, the worship of the generative powers in 1865, page 137. And he says, uh, Gausseron de Montpezant, a knight of province, said that their superior showed him an idol made in the form of Baphomet. Another named Raymond Rube described it as a wooden head on which the figure of Baphomet was painted and adds that he worshipped it by kissing its feet and exclaiming, Yala! which was, he says, verbum uh, saracenorum, a word taken from the Saracens. And so the Saracens are various, at least from this perspective during that time, probably referring to various Arab tribes. A Templar of Florence declared that in the secret chapters of the order, one brother said to the other, showing the idol, adore this head. This head is your God and your Mahomet. And so, okay, I've already talked to you guys about some of the etymolo etymologies, but this one right here is particularly interesting that I wanted to highlight. And that is uh, Hugh J. Sh uh, Schoenfeld, one of the scholars who worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls, argued in his book, The Essene Odyssey, that the word Baphomet was created with knowledge of the Atbash substitution cipher, which substitutes the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet for the last, the second for the second last, and so on. And Baphomet, rendered in Hebrew, interpreted using Atbash, becomes Shofia, or Shofia, which can be interpreted as the Greek word Sophia, meaning wisdom. That's where, again, I believe Baphometis is the true origins. Now, most people are going to say, again, it comes from Mahomet, but I, I think this guy right here is much more onto the true meaning. This theory appears in an important plot point in the novel De Da Vinci Code, although it was recently questioned by the French historian Thierry Mercia, who challenges this method of calculation used by Schoenfield. Okay. Now, one of the guys that is most notorious talking about the Templars and Baphomet is this guy right here, Joseph von Hammer Pergstahl. And so if we go right here, this is a guy who's he appears to be very much in favor of this stuff. And um, he recently went to Yale where they have uh, Pergstahl's book. And so any discussion of Baphomet, the idol purportedly worshipped by the Knights Timbar, invariably turns to uh, Hammer Pergstahl's essay, Mysterium Baphometis Revelatum. It is the origin of the oft-contested claim that the name Baphomet derived from the Greek Baphometis. Exactly. You see, that's what I believe, but that's not what the normie opinion is. It's Mahomet. Etymological veracity, notwithstanding this influential document, is historically important in the mythology of the Knights Templar, much like Antoine Court de uh, Geblin's claim in Le Monde Primtif that the tarot derived from the ancient Egyptian mysteries, although demonstrably false, this assertion nevertheless influenced legends about tarot. Okay, so now I want to read you a little bit about what Perkstall believed. So in 1818, the name Baphomet appeared in an essay by the Vien Viennese orientalist jo Joseph von Hammer Perkstall. Okay. Uh, discovery of the mystery of Baphomet by which the Knights Templars, like the Gnostics and Ophites, are convicted of apostasy and idolatry and moral impurity by their own monuments, which, rep which presented an elaborate pseudo-history constructed to discredit Templarist masonry and, by extension, Freemasonry. Following Nikolai, he argued using the archaeological evidence, Baphomets faked by earlier scholars and literary evidence 
such as the grail romances that the Templars were Gnostics, which is what I believe firmly, and the Templars head was a Gnostic idol called Baphomet. So here is Baphomet in the Encyclopedia of Americana. His chief subject is the images, which are called Baphomet, found in several museums and collections of antiquities in the Weimar. Now we know I actually have Hitler's favorite book, and it's a book on ritualistic magic. And we know that the Third Reich was very much interested in uh, the occult of which it got the swastika, which their swastika turns counterclockwise. And anybody who's been to East Asia, most notably China, which where I was in, all vegetarian food has a swastika on it, but that swastika is going clockwise, and that represents the sun. And the clockwise and counterclockwise swastika have different meanings within Buddhism and Hinduism. So interesting stuff there. Anyways, and in the burial and cabinet in Vienna, these little... Images are of stone, partly hermaphrodites, having generally two heads or two faces with a beard. But in other respects, male or female figures, most of them accompanied by serpents, the sun and moon and other strange emblems and bearing many inscriptions, mostly in Arabic. The inscriptions he reduces almost to mete, which is, according to him, not the metis of the Greeks, but the Sophia of the Ophites which was represented half man, half woman as the symbol of wisdom, which you also see anybody who's familiar with alchemy and like the rebus symbol, that's exactly what you see. Unnatural voluptuousness and the principle of sensuality. He asserts that those small figures are such as the Templars, according to the statement of a witness carried with them in their coffers. Baphomet signifies bafe metos. Uh, baptism of metis, baptism of fire, or the Gnostic baptism, an enlightening of the mind, which, however, was interpreted by the Ophites in the obs obscene sense of fleshly union. The fundamental assertion that those idols and cups came from the Templars has been considered as unfounded, especially as the images known to have existed among the Templars seem rather to be images of saints. Yeah. Well, Again, I would connect a lot of this sexual stuff with even Aleister Crowley, right? We know for a fact, Aleister Crowley, anybody who's read his stuff um, and looked into Thelema knows that he had a boyfriend in which they would perform various homosexual rituals together and believe that no man could truly be a good magician without basically having been penetrated and penetrated another man. And so these Gnostic or secret occult rituals I don't think it's totally out of question to think that maybe these Templars were participating in the same thing, given that people like Aleister Crowley would literally say that they are the continuation of these rituals and they themselves openly profess that they do it. So I don't know. I don't know. So again, I'm obviously coming at this from an Orthodox perspective. So here's Eliaphas Levi, and here's one of his descriptions. Um, on the dogma and ritual uh, of magic. So he says the goat on the front piece carries the sign of the pentagram on the forehead with one point at the top, a symbol of light Two with his two hands forming a sign of occultism. The one pointing up to the white moon of Chesed, the other pointing down to the black one, Gabura. This sign expresses is the perfect harmony of mercy with justice. His one arm is female, the other male, like the ones of his androgyne of the Kunroth. His the abilities of which he had to unite with those of our goat because he is the one and the same symbol. The flame of intelligence shining between his horns is the magic light of the universal balance. Uh, the image of the soul elevated above matter has the flame while being tied to matter shines above it. The beast head expresses the horror of the sinner whose materially acting solely responsible part has to bear the punishment exclusively. The soul is insensitive according to its nature and can only suffer when it materializes the rod standing inside of genitals symbolizes eternal life, the body covered with scales the water, the semicircle above it, the atmosphere, the feathers flowing, following above, the volatile 
Humanity is represented by the two breasts and the androgyne arms as the sphinx of the occult sciences. So again, what he's describing and is his little creation right here. Okay. So he's trying to explain why he created it the way that he does. See, he has sort of reptile scales down here. So even then he has feathers, he has wings, he's got goats. Um, this is supposed to represent the elevation of the soul. And so <clears throat> anyways, if you guys want to look up this stuff and read more about the witch's Sabbath and so on, feel free to do so. Um, you know, the goat of Mindy's, um, so the link between Baphomet and the pagan God Pan was also observed by Aleister Crowley. So, uh, this is by EA walls. Budge writes at several places in the Delta Hermopolis, uh, Lycopolis and Mindy's the God Pan and a goat were worshipped. Strabo, quoting Pindar, says that these places goats had intercourse with women. And Herodotus instances a case which was said to have taken place in the open day. The Mendizians, according to the last writer, paid reverence to all goats and more to the males than to the females, and particularly to one he-goat, on the death of which the public mourning is observed throughout the whole Mendesian district. They call both Pan and the goat Mendes, and both were worshipped as gods of generation and fecundity. Diodorus compares the cult of the goat of Mendes with that of Priapus and groups with groups the god of the Pans and the Satyrs. So, uh, so many pleasures rev uh, revered before the advent of Christianity were condemned by the new religion. You don't say, you don't say it required little change over to transform the horns and cloven hooves of pan into a most convincing devil. Pan's attributes could neatly be changed into charged with punishment sins. And so the metamorphosis was complete. Um, here's Aleister Crowley, of which he actually says in the mysteries of mysteries, his name is Baphomet. So uh, Crowley claims to be Baphomet. And he says that the devil does not exist. It is a false name invented by the black brothers to imply a unity in their ignorant muddle of disper of dispersions. A devil who had unity would be a God. The devil is historically the God of any people that one personally dislikes. This serpent, Satan is not the enemy of man, but he who made gods of our race, knowing good and evil, he bade know thyself and taught initiation. He is the devil. The book of Thoth, his emblem is Baphomet, the androgyne, who is the hieroglyph of arcane perfection. He is therefore life and love. But moreover, his letter is Ayin, the I, the I, the Illuminati I, so that his light and his zodical image is uh, Capricornus, the leaping goat whose attribute is liberty. Aha, uh -huh. of course. So let's go here. I want to show you guys something real quick and looking at an interesting little symbol that's present at uh, a very important building where many elites gather together. So check this out. Where the world leaders meet when there is a threat to peace, they decide the fate of nations. Notice the giant mural that towers over the Security Council room. The central focus of the UN mural is the phoenix bird that has risen. The phoenix bird is a symbol of Lucifer. The Egyptians believed that the phoenix symbolized a god who rose to heaven in the form of a morning star like Lucifer after his fire immolation of death and rebirth. Notice that the phoenix bird is not standing above his own ashes. He is standing above his old skin. Like a snake, he has shed his old skin and is revealing himself as God at the center of the mural. At the top left, there is a church steeple without a cross. The missing cross symbolizes the death of Christianity. Below, a woman receives the rays of the sun god while the man in front of her plays Pan's flute. To their right are two pyramid symbols and people joined together by a long blue serpent-like claw. 
Below the risen phoenix, a sword is driven through a dragon beast. This represents the killing of all beliefs and religions that depicted Lucifer as a beast. The New World religion worships him as beautiful. Behind the phoenix, the ghostly figures of the walking dead are stepping into a void. They symbolize depopulation. On the right panel, the pale horse from the book of Revelation is the bringer of death to humanity through weapons, hunger, and disease. The man is releasing him. The chained black man represents slavery, while the top panel of the mural shows a technologically advanced white race who control industry, art, and science. In this post-apocalyptic mural, the military man standing on the tail of the beast represents worldwide military power. He tips his helmet to the elite who are climbing out from underground cities where they safely hid from the apocalypse. So just wanted to highlight that little, uh, little interesting video in regards to some of the symbolism and how that relates to everything that we just talked about. So, now, with all that being said, let's read uh, this article on the history of Baphomet of now. So many of you guys are going to be quite familiar with all this stuff, given what we've just talked about. And so, as I said, most of the people who write, and I went through tons of articles, very few of them actually believe that there's any sp spiritual significance to Baphomet. And they would highlight the Church of Satan and then LeVay and that they're atheists. They actually don't believe in a God. And, and it's these weird Christians. They... They're just too serious about symbols and they don't get it and stuff like that. So um, just wanted to highlight that. But we'll, let's move through this article here. Oh, actually, we got a few super chats. Let me uh, let me address these super chats real quick before we go through any further. Um, we have five dollars that came in over on Streamlabs by Harry Serpanos. Thank you so much, Harry Serpanos. He throws in five dollars and says, Merry Christmas. And Happy New Year, DPH. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you, Harry. And he said, God bless you for all your good work. Also, witches, Sabbath seems to be linked to Baphomet as well. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that was the section under Eliphas Levi, which he connects the witches' Sabbath to Baphomet because he is the Sabbatic goat, right? Baphomet is the Sabbatic goat. So you're right on. You're right on, Harry. Thank you so much, brother. Really appreciate the support. And then it looks like we had one come in over on YouTube. Uh, shout out to Deadpool Kid throws in $10. And he said, seems to me all the occultist nerds are a bunch of horny goats. <laughs> yeah, it always turns into butt stuff. That's for sure. Almost you go down these rabbit holes and pretty soon somebody's doing something very gay. Um, so I totally agree with you. It's a, It's a bunch of horny nerds and creating various rituals who just always seem to move back to sort of a satanic world. So th thank you so much, Deadpool kid. I totally agree with you. God bless you, man. Merry Christmas and happy new year to you and your family. Um, and then let me uh, check the dono chat. If anybody sent anything in over there, looks like they didn't. Again, if you guys want to support the stream, feel free to send in a super chat or a comment or a question over on Streamlabs or Dono Chat. Or if you prefer to use YouTube, feel free to use YouTube. If we can, can anybody gift some memberships? Would love to gift some memberships. Uh, yeah, Bohemian Grove is another example. Exactly. It's um, it's another example. It wasn't Nixon on record talking about how it was one of the, I won't use the word he says, but one of the gayest things he's ever seen in his life was uh, Bohemian Grove, of which Alex Jones infiltrated. He claims he was hit on, that there was a bunch of gay prostitutes there, male prostitutes. Um, again, I'm, I'm beginning to see a pattern. I don't know if you guys are. And that's where, again, this is a leap. This is a speculation. This is my own opinion. This is my own belief as a Christian. But you notice the, the Templars and how much money and power they acquired during their their crusading period and of course that was confiscated by king philip of france but you think about money money baphomet satanism weird sexual rituals and you can't be you can't help to begin to think about again this gentleman right here um ronald bernard elite banker exposes a satanic elite now we would watch this video but we, we just don't have time 
And it goes into how he claims he was recruited to participate in a satanic ritual of child sacrifice. And he was one of these sort of banker elites. Dutch banker Ronald Bernard describes his experience with the in his rise to the top circles within a, within the elite. In this highly disturbing interview, Bernard talks of how he was being trained to be a psychopath and how the breaking point was when he was asked to participate in child sacrifice child sacrifice the worship of satan is prominent within elite circles and their lust for being passed down to societies uh subliminally through the media education and war and so it is quite an issue here i'll share this link with you guys so if you guys want you can check it out later um here it is right here and so if you guys want to check that out feel free oh my gosh thank you guys so much uh retrocoplit i always mess your name up retrocoplit cup lips gosh retro calypse throws in 10 gifted 10 codal crew memberships thank you so much brother really really appreciate that and welcome the new codal crew members welcome jfw welcome uh it it is it's uh welcome don burn welcome overlord 3001 welcome kicks against the pricks welcome Talison McDonald, welcome T Wizard, welcome your local milk people, welcome Melaforta, welcome DC Woodwork. I know many of you guys already have memberships, but uh, welcome Daniel Zinn, welcome Meister Knight Allen Company, welcome PKD's Ghost, welcome Big L. Uh, so uh, thank you guys very much. Um, or it looks like that was everybody, and then we and then. Um, Tommy Jones also gifted five Codal Crew memberships. So thank you so much, Tommy Jones. Thank you so much, Retro Calypse, uh, for the 10 Codal Crew memberships. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you very, very much, Tommy Jones. God bless you guys. Really, really appreciate it. Really, really do. So it's the season of giving. So I hope you guys enjoy your new memberships. Really appreciate you guys. You guys are the best. Really literally the best truly appreciate it. your local milk people welcome brother to the Kotal crew um and so let's uh anyways i shared that link with you guys if anybody wants to check it out um uh daniel levy says enjoyed your appearance on the crucible well thank you very much daniel levy really appreciate that uh yeah andrew's a good friend him and rachel are they're good people they're really good people and so anyways, thank you all. Enjoy the new memberships. It rhymes with apocalypse. I know it's the retro that always throws me off, bro. <laughs> he says it rhymes with apocalypse. Retrocalypse. There we go. Ret Retrocalypse. 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 I got it now. Retrocalypse. I got it. I got it. So thank you so much, brother. Really appreciate that generous gifting of 10 memberships. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate you guys. Oh, he says, no soft O. Retrocalypse. Retrocalypse. Okay, retrocalypse. There we go. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> I, I got you, bro. Retrocalypse rhymes with apocalypse. Retrocalypse got you. It's the O that throws me off. The retro. I try to pronounce all the vowels. <laughs> so thank you, Retrocalypse, for the generous gifting of ten Kotal Crew memberships. Um, really appreciate you, man. God bless and thank you to Tommy Jones as well. Really appreciate you guys. Red Rocker Lips. <laughs> yeah, I hope you guys have fun with me butchering ret Retroclips. Okay. So anyways, uh, <laughs> love you DHP. I see what you did there. Deliberate missing of the name. I see what you did. I see what you did. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, retro clips. Okay. Anyways, I'm probably screwing it up again. Thank you guys for the gifting of the memberships. Really appreciate you guys. Okay. So anyways, I connect, I imagine the Templars, and the banking elite, I don't think it's too different. So, okay, moving back to our article here. With groups like the Satanic Temple getting more media attention around their activism against theocracy. Yes, because theocracy is definitely on the rise in America. Yeah, one of the most degenerate nations in the world. 
One symbolic icon, Baphomet, has been getting more public exposure. A majority of the Magnolia Films movie, Hail Satan, which is a sort of celebration of the Church of Satan and their erecting of Baphomet monuments, uh, centered around the Satanic Temple's effort to erect their Baphomet statue on government properties where Ten Commandments statue had been placed to emphasize the government's stance on freedom of religion as stated in the Constitution. Additionally, they encountered arguments that the Ten Commandments had cultural significance by stating that Baphomet had cultural significance as well, just as any, I hate judeo I hate that, just as any Christian iconography does. That got me thinking, who is Baphomet? I personally didn't have much knowledge about Baphomet or its history, so I set out to learn more about Baph what Baphomet is really about. And so here is the Mysterium Baphometus Revelatum. Um, again, we can see the sort of hermaphroditic figure, uh, definitely some saggy breasts there, uh, but we see the solar and the lunar imagery, the bringing together of opposites. Birth of Baphomet. Historians have noted that the first written occurrence of Baphomet was in 1098 by Anselm of Ribamont, who was the Count of Ostravant and uh, Valencianus. I don't even know where that is, and is considered to be one of the most brilliant figures in the First Crusade. Anselm made many written eyewitness accounts of the events of the First Crusade. Anselm recounted in his writing the events of the Siege of Antioch, during which he stated that the Turks called loudly upon Baphomet. And given the context, most scholars believe that the word referred to Muhammad, the founder of Islam, as recounted in Zrinka's book, uh, Pornographic Archaeology, Medicine, Medievalism, and the Invention of the French Nation, German author Christoph Friedrich Nikolai wrote in 1782 about Baphomet being mentioned during a course of a description of the Templar witnesses interrogated by the ecclesiastical authorities in uh, Carcassonne, where the witnesses mentioned that Baphomet was not the name of the idol, but rather a hieroglyph imprinted on it. The head had been a symbol, the image of the eternal father in the state of rest. The Templars were supposedly introduced to Gnosticism in the Orient, since the Orient, above all Syria, was the refuge of all the sectarians and heretics banished by the Western Christian Empire. no. The Byzantine Empire also banished them. The Byzantine Empire, you could argue, was even more uh, strict on some of this stuff. And that's why the Polyseans and the Trondrakians, they were in Armenia because Armenia was a safe haven between the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire or the rise of Islam um, after, you know, 630, 640, that Armenia was a place in which many of these Gnostic heresies kind of found refuge. And in fact, Armenia for almost 100 years was basically gnostic um due to the influence of the Polyseans and the tondrakians and then the bogomils for example were in bulgaria before they converted to orthodoxy so it's not just western christianity um stalha jock goes on to note how baphomet was merely an idol for the templars and not in any way a god given that the templar denied god and spat on the cross well, because they spat on the cross, Baphomet wasn't a god. What a dumb argument. And it was postulated by Joseph von Hammer Perkstall in his book, as we've already talked about, that Bahumed or Bahumet was one of their secret and mysterious formulas with which they addressed the idol of a calf in their secret assemblies due to the fact that Bahumid translated into calf in the Arabic language. What I find particularly fascinating is that given the secretive and mysterious nature of the Templars in this regard, it has since been quite a topic of debate with many theories, yet few definitive answers as to the true meaning of what Baphomet truly meant to the Templars. For example, just four years after Hammer Perkstall released his book on hieroglyphics, Anton Isaac Silverster de Sacy, France's great Orientalist and Arabist shook the ground under Hammer Bergstahl's affirmation by pointing out the impossibility that knowledge of the hieroglyphs had as transferred from the ancients to the Arabs, accusing Hammer Bergstahl of failing to show how knowledge of hieroglyphic writing, which was lost, or so it appears, along be long before the Arabs were the masters of Egypt, could have emerged from the shadows that covered up to pass their hands. Given this idea, Sacy made the argument that it was more likely the relation between the word Baphometus, as cited and recorded by the Templar trial, and Bahumid is purely accidental, without grounding in etymology, and therefore it must have been a term which actually stood to mean 
Muhammad. Oh, yes, of course. It just meant Muhammad. As we said, that totally negates the Gnostic influence of the Templars and people like the Ophites, the Bogomils, uh, the um, uh, the Carpocratians, all those different groups, the Polyseans, they preserved. And, and again, I did a whole thing on Gnosticism and showed that many of these Gnostic groups, according to themselves, believe that they were the continuation of the Alicinian mystery. So these ancient mystery rites were, in fact, included within Gnostic groups. And even if even parts of the Nag Hammadi scriptures talk about how the Gnostics believe themselves to be the progenitors of Eleusis. So the idea, well, how would any of these ancient rites be preserved into the Middle Ages? Uh, quite easy. It's the Gnostics, bro. Anyways, moving forward, the fur to further add to the argumentative fire, Francois Ranonard uh, wrote in the 1813 edition that Baphomet was a simple scribal error or mispronunciation and not an esoteric mystery, arguing that scribe who recounted the questioning of the witness in the deposition clearly made a mistake in spelling or pronunciation when scribbling the testimony, either because in the southern provinces the name of, Mah of Muhammad <laughs> was thus pronounced, or because the scribe wrote Baphometi in error, as he also wrote as Azorar instead of Adorar. And must and what must leave no doubt is in this respect is that the witnesses claimed that he made to pronounce Yala, a Saracen word, which he says means God. Aha. Uh -huh. So here we get into all the Muslim stuff. I'm going to kind of skip over this because I've already given you my take. And if you want to read it here, I'll share this link with you guys. If you guys want to read this article yourself, feel free. Let me share this to you, all of you. Um, so there you go right there. Uh, there's that if you guys want to read it. Okay, moving forward. Um, I want to skip this section because, as I said, I, I disagree with the whole Muhammad thing. But that's what most people believe. To continue the semantic argument, meaning the origin of Baphomet, Schoenfeld published his book, The Essene Odyssey, in 1984, in which he argued that the word Baphomet, which we already discussed, was likely created through Atbish substitution cipher. Yes. So, again, this is he got all this from Wikipedia. Um, and that deliberately meant, since the word Sophia was used to reference to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, yes, because... <laughs> Sophia in the Gnostic tradition is the exact same as of the Holy Spirit. You see, these people have no understanding of theology in that it's a, a word fallacy that just because one word means one thing doesn't mean that's an interpreted to mean the same thing in a different context. But again, I digress. It could be that the implication was of an inclusive wisdom. And additionally, that Eliphas Levi may have specifically included visual symbology, which was pointedly inclusive. <gasps> oh, it's, oh, he was like the first DEI scholar. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. I love Baphomet. Uh, was inclusive of not only the divine feminine, but also of higher divine wisdom that could be gained from sources usually rejected or associated with darkness, sin, and evil. And as I myself have theorized, quite possibly more than a simple slash casual connection to Abraxas, the Balasidian Gnostic deity that was held as the highest of the 365 levels of the celestial heavenly sphere of Balasidian Gnosticism. That is true. So here's a life as Levi's Baphomet. Modern day Baphomet we know today. In 1856, a life as Levi published uh, Dogma and Ritual and uh, black magic in which he depicted Baphomet. Levi's depiction of Baphomet has become the primary idea of what Baphomet looks like in the occult communities ever since it was originally published. And that's why I wanted to read Alive as Levi to you guys. And you can get his history of magic. He has a lot of books on magic. As it said, he wrote like over 20. Levi's Baphomet has some unique features that had not been prevalent in previous depictions of the Tiff Blar's Baphomet. Levi's Baphomet was unique um, has unique features such as words carved in its arms. Yes, the alchemical uh, coagula, salve. Yes, we discussed that. A torch on its head and quite a few others. In a passage from his book, Levi describes some of these unique features as, and this is life as Levi, the goat on the front piece carries the sign of the pentacle. Okay, we already read this. So we, we've already read that earlier. 
It's also important to note that in Levi's depiction of Baphomet, it has words carved slash tattooed on his arm, salve on the arm pointing up and coagula on the arm pointing down. Salve et coagula is a symbolic phrase of Latin alchemy, which means the breaking down of elements and they're coming together. The juxtaposition of these words together express transmutation from base to finer state, a perpetual goal of spiritual growth and human evolution. Something that I find particularly interesting about the, their placement on Baphomet is the word solve, which is the breaking down or apart elements of the phrase is on the arm, which is pointing up toward the white moon of Chesed, which is representative love or heaven, while the placement of the word coagula which is the bringing together element of the phrase is on the arm pointing down towards the black moon of Gabura, which is representative of strength or hell. Levi Baphomet was actually named the goat of Mendes, which historians believe was a reference to Herodotus' depiction of the goat of Mendes, the Greek name for the ancient Egyptian deity, which had a goat's face and uh, face and legs. So here again is the tarot card of the devil. This is from the writer White tarot one of the more popular ones and he does in fact have ram horns kind of like my thumbnail so it's again the ram horns as was in my thumb it's not totally false about baphomet clearly there's uh indications of that usage so anyways moving on levi's baphomet later became an important icon of alistair crowley's religion religion thelema and was included in crowley's creed of the gnostic catholic church which was recited during their gnostic mass of which I recount a story of going to a Gnostic Mass on my website. So if you want to hear that, uh, make sure you become a website member. Levi's depiction of Baphomet was also, has also been the inscription for many depictions of Satan or demons in other mediums, such as the Rider Waite's uh, design of the devil card in the tarot deck from the early 1900s. Waite stated, since 1856, the influence of Eliaphas Levi and his doctrine of occultism has changed the face of this card, and it now appears as a pseudo-Baphometic figure with the head of a goat and a great torch between its horns. It is seated instead of erect, and in place of the generative organs, there is the hermetic caduceus. Additionally, Baphomet was featured in the Dungeons & Dragons adventure module, the Lost uh, Caravan... Uh, Caravans of, I don't even know what that is. I've never played Dungeon and Dragons. Um, in 1982, as a demon lord, as well as a, another Dungeon and Dragon supplemental source book called Fiendish Codex One, The Hordes of the Abyss in 2006, Baphomet has also found its way into other popular culture, such as a video games, music, and television movies. A demon very similar to Baphomet was an enemy in the final level of Doom 2, Hell on Earth, released in 1994. A Wolfstein mod released in 2011 called Tristana 3D featured Baphomet as the antagonist of the game. In 2015, musician That Poppy released a song called Low Life, in which she can be seen in the beginning making the pose that Baphomet is making in Levi's depiction, and the video has other imagery of Satan and recognizable poses tied to religion or the occult. A statue of Baphomet was also featured in the 2018 Netflix series called Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. In 2014, the Satanic Temple began construction of a Baphomet statue to donate to Oklahoma State Capitol. They desire to donate the statue so that it may be placed beside a Ten Commandments state that had been erected on the Capitol's lawn in 2012 as a way to display America's freedom of religion. Oh, good for secularism, right? Oh, I'm so thankful for secularism. <clears throat> um, freedom of religion and to help the state of Oklahoma from looking like an unfairly support one religion over others. Yes, because all religions are equal, right? In an interview with Vice News, the temple's co-founder and spokesman, Lucien Greaves, stated that the idea that the Ten Commandments are foundational to U.S. or Oklahoma law is absurd and obscene. I would argue that the message behind our monument speaks more directly to the formation of U.S. constitutional values than the Ten Commandments possibly could. It especially does so when it stands directly beside the Ten Commandments as it affirms no one religion enjoys legal preference. I mean, certainly, and we'll talk about it in my uh, stream on Freemasonry and the revolutionary spirit. Certainly the founding fathers were Masons 
And I'm sure they were privy to some of the Baphomet elements within their own practices, but uh, only nine of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. And so I would say certainly the Ten Commandments are more representative of the values of the 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 signers of the Declaration of Independence than Baphomet. Anyways, I digress. It was also stated by the Satanic Temple that the Ten Commandments statue was to be taken down. They would no longer have a desire to juxtapose their Baphomet statue there since the point of wanting their statue placed was to show a dichotomy or religious thus expressing religious pluralism and freedom in America. When the legislator at the Oklahoma State Capitol refused to accept the Baphomet statue, the Satanic Temple filed a lawsuit against the state of Oklahoma, which led to a Oklahoma Supreme Court ruling on June 30th, 2015, which said in a 7-2 ruling, the display violated a provision in the state constitution prohibiting use of state property to further religions. As a result of the ruling, Oklahoma County Judge Thomas Prince ordered that the Ten Commandments statue be removed by October 12, 2015. From then, the Baphomet statue traveled to Arkansas to fight once again to be placed on the government property next to a Ten Commandments statue. They really hate the Ten Commandments, don't they? It might be why the Church of Satan believes that abortion is part of their ritualistic sacrament. From the most recent information I could find, it seems that they may still be wanting or waiting on a ruling by the Arkansas Supreme Court on a religious discrimination lawsuit. Baphomet has been a figure in human history for a long time, and it holds a large amount of significance throughout many religions, from Islam, possibly depending on how you see the Templars, to sectarianism, to Gnosticism, to Satanism, and beyond. For some, it seems Baphomet is synonymous with the devil, while others see it as iconography of something more complex. No matter what people ultimately believe, it is clear that Baphomet is an influential part of our history as a species and will continue to live on as a prominent icon for centuries to come. Okay, wonderful. So moving on here, I wanted to bring up um, Celine Dion's child clothing line as we wrap up the stream. So guys, smash that like if you're here, if you appreciated this stream, and if you want to throw some show some support or uh, ask a question, feel free to send anything in on the Dono chat or the Streamlabs link or here on YouTube. Any of that would be wonderful. And so Celine Dion created a clothing line to promote gender neutrality. Oh, I wonder why Baphomet would be important for that. Maybe because Baphomet is related to the sort of transgender homosexual movements here in the United States? Hmm, I would think so. And of course, this article right here, homosexually gender confusion in the spirit of Baphomet, says the same thing. This post will attempt to reveal the link between the homosexual transgender anti-gender role movement and how they are linked to the occult god Baphomet, as well as how this entire agenda is a collaborative effort by the elite to destroy the nuclear family as well as render the biblical roles of men and women obsolete. Many believe that the Antichrist will himself be a sodomite. The information provided in this post will give greater insight as to why the Antichrist may very well be a homosexual and how this relates to the satanic worship of Baphomet. First, I'll provide a brief history of Baphomet's worship. Okay, so we don't need, we've already looked at Baphomet worship, oh, and we'll skip over to here. It has been linked that within the elite that sodomy rituals are a common practice, as are some sex magic rituals, Aleister Crowley being one. Uh, where demonic entities are petitioned for power and possession. This link is crucial to the persistent homosexual agenda as the elite seek to make clear-cut gender roles obsolete. This is also at the root of feminism as the goal of feminism works in cooperation with the homosexual community to liberate society from traditional gender roles. To be specifically male or female is considered passe as pop stars and other celebrities hail and laud the homosexual, lesbian, transgender lifestyle. It's no longer cool to be a man. If you're not at least a little metrosexual and women who simply desire to get married and have children are looked upon as bottom feeding breeders by a growing movement that condemns people who actually procreate rumors of Lady Gaga being a hermaphrodite, having both male and female genitalia have been the topic of internet legend. However, it may be true. If for no other reason, it would get good reason for her to consent uh, or for her constant references, the Baphomet. And so this is Lady Gaga and stuff like that. 
Um, Baphomet worship has become pervasive throughout the media as the elite understand that the more they eat away at the very fabric of the traditional family, the more likely they are to succeed in overthrowing the absolutes and morality. Baphomet is the ultimate gray area that challenges biblical values and seeks to render them archaic and irrelevant. It is within your best interest to recognize this subversive behavior as it is this very climate that is sucking children into a vacuum of sexual perversion and confusion via media indoctrination. There is a serious problem with a little boy wanting to dress up like a princess or worse who believes that he could actually be born a girl and vice versa. There is something troublesome about a little girl who believes that she could actually be male and not female as God made a mistake. And so anyways, a few references here. So looking at Celine Dion's new clothing line, uh, let's play this right here. I want you to guys to see a little commercial that she made for her children's clothing line. You tell me what type of vibes you guys get from it. It's okay. It's okay. I'm Celine Dion. Our children, they are not really our children, as we are all just links in a never-ending chain. So you don't really have children. They're everybody's children. In fact, Celine Dion has every right to your child as much as you do, according to her. That is life. For us, they are everything. But in reality, we are only a fraction of their universe. So she blows black dust and all of a sudden it moves from blue and pink representative male and female to a sort of gray, dark, demonic representation of, I mean, look at this toy. Does that look like a demon or something? I mean, nothing, nothing about this is aesthetic or beautiful. I can't believe they call security. I'm not spending the night in jail. Holy shit. Easy. I'm Celine Dion. Yeah, girl. And I'm Beyonce. I'm calling my agent. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. So cool. Uh, let me grab some photos of this. Um, oh, let's go back. No, 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 Um, Celine Dion baby clothing line. Let me see if I can find some photos of it. Images. Um, oh, where? Yeah. So here, here's a non-gender clothing line with a bunch of human skulls. Hmm. Now, as I said, human skulls, just in general symbolism, it depends on how you interpret it. The Orthodox Church has skulls representative of us remembering our death and judgment day. But why would you put human skulls on a baby onesie? It almost looks demonic. Can you imagine that? Again, all black with uh, inverted five-pointed stars. Huh. Strange. Very strange. Uh, I wish there was more, more photos of it. What is it with... The, with is it new nun unu let me see uh nun unu yeah one of the yeah this was one of the photos the let me put that in here's the clothing line it is what it is. Okay. High maintenance, skulls, black, weird monsters, all seeing eyes, single eyes, fi un inverted five pointed stars. Everything's black. They're putting uh, fake tattoos on children. Huh? Wow. What a beautiful child clothing line that is. What a beautiful child clothing line. You can tell she really cares about the children. I believe Celine Dion doesn't even have children, and I believe that she's quite sick right now. Um, uh, I forget what exactly the disease she's plagued with, but general neutral clothing line isn't a new concept for children. 
Oh, this is great. Gen gender neutral clothing line. Oh, avoiding clothing that promotes gender stereotypes. Yes, we don't want clothing that promotes the idea of male and female. That's so antiquated. So I just wanted to highlight that. And of course, we know of Balenciaga. Balenciaga's child. Uh, here, let's pull this up right here. Belgian artists' work often features children and depictions of castrated child, castrated toddlers. And we right here we see a toddler looks like covered in fake blood. Huh. Weird. Their S&M teddy bear scandal. Yes, they had teddy bears for kids to play with that got sexually abused. Wow, very cool. Yeah, it was never our intent. We condemn child abuse. It was never our intent to include it in our narrative. You literally had children, toddlers in blood. What are you talking about? These people are evil. The statement goes on to say its decision to feature children with the plush bears dressed in BDSM inspired outfits was a wrong choice. You think so? Do you think so? These people are disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. And so I just wanted to highlight that this stuff is kind of prominent within our culture. It's not hidden. It's right in plain sight. And so here is the uh, occultworld.com. So this is a place in which magicians and various practitioners, occultists go to. And it itself highlights, again, what a Baphomet represents. Basically, everything we talked about. Aleister Crowley named himself Baphomet when he joined the Ordo Templi Orient. Orientis, uh, a, a secret sexual magic order found in 1896 in Germany. Yeah, where they had a lot of gay stuff going on. And then here's another website, Freemasonry Watch, in which the free this is a Freemason talking about uh, the prevalence of goat symbolism and why the goat symbolism is a good thing and how it relates to Pan and all this different stuff and how it's biblical, right? And it's nothing, it's nothing to worry about. So if you guys want to read that, I'm going to share that with you guys right now. Okay. Um, and so, and then here is, yes, an after-school Satan club could be coming to your kid's grade school. Uh, reporting from Seattle, Lilith Starr, a devil's advocate in every sense, is in a rush to get her after-school Satan club started. As founder of the Satanic Temple of Seattle, she's under pressure from National Satanic Headquarters located in the colonial witch trials city of Salem, Massachusetts, to launch a counterstrike against grade school Christianity by opening an after-school Satan club. I think many people have a misunderstanding that we are some kind of tongue-in-cheek troll group, said Starr, who's 44, a Harvard grad who sometimes dresses in church robes and then when circumstances demand, paints her lips and part of her face black. But in reality, we are a very serious religion. And with our own shared narrative, culture, and symbols, a code of ethics, our seven tenets, and worship in the form of activism. The national movement is attempting to establish a dozen after-school Satan clubs across the country. Local chapters have applied for space at public schools in cities including Atlanta, Detroit, Washington, Portland, Oregon, Tacoma, Washington, Salt Lake City, Tuscan, and Los Angeles. The clubs are seeking school district approval with the Atlanta area club saying it hopes to hold its first meeting by Halloween. The Los Angeles Unified School District appears to be the only school district to outright reject the club. In response to a Los Angeles Times inquiry Monday, the district issued a statement stating the club proposed for Chase Elementary School in uh, Panorama City 
does not meet the minimum requirement of having the school's approval and therefore will not be offered at the school. The rejection could lead to a legal challenge. The Christians may have the force of heaven behind them, but the Satanists have the U.S. Supreme Court. In 2001, the high court ruling in a civil case brought by the Child Evangelism Fellowship of Missouri held that when a government operates a limited public forum, such as after-school clubs, it can't discriminate against the kind of speech that takes place. The victory permitted the clubs to proselytize in public classrooms after hours. It also opened the school uh, door for students of any faith or no faith to be taught the ways of Satanism. Okay. 15 years later, with the Christian-based Good News Club having expanded to hundreds of schools across the U.S., the Satanists are responding. While Good News Clubs are effectively Bible and faith classes for children, the Satan Clubs intend to preach scientific evolution of humankind rather than what they describe as the superstitions of organized religion. We believe strongly in religious plurality, and we fight for equal representation for all religions, Starr said. Whenever religion enters the public sphere, like the Good News Club, the public schools, we take action to ensure that more than one religious voice is represented. And that is our intent, our after-school Satan Club. The Satanic Temple website says that the group does not believe in a personal Satan or an advocate or advocate evil, though it does embrace blasphemy as a legitimate form of expression now there are other churches of satan like the church of set which is explicitly theistic theistic and i told you that during my time in the bay area there was a transgender student uh chick who identified as a male who had a girlfriend and specifically wanted to be referred to as a lesbian so yeah that doesn't check out but um she was a high priestess at her own theistic satanic church and temple, which she said was like predominantly LGBTQ. And they did, they practice a sort of inverted Catholic Eucharist where they would use menstrual blood or feces or urine on a wafer and consume that because they talked about if they could do that, there's no boundaries that they couldn't cross getting back to Baphomet and the dissolution of boundaries and bringing all these things together, you can see the theology there. So anyways, we don't need to continue on here, but this article just talks about the Satan Club and that pretty much is going to do my stream tonight. So I want to thank you all for being here. God bless you all. I know that this could be a little bit of a difficult topic to stomach, um, but it's important to know about, and I know me, multiple people asked me to do an overview of Baphomet, and I hope this did justice. I hope this um, was beneficial to you guys. So anyways, I'm going to get out of here. Um, I wish all you, I may do a stream on Sunday um, or Monday. We'll see, but I wish you guys the absolute best. God bless you all, and I will see you whenever I see you. As always. Uh, or let me just double check, actually, make sure we didn't get any more Super Chat. Oh, we do have one. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on. Let me address some of these Super Chats real quick. Um, so, oh, my sister Amptown throws in $10. No comment. God bless you. God bless you, Amptown. I hope to see you at church. We've been missing you. Subdeacon Mark and I were talking. We miss you. We, we hope that you come. Again, this coming Sunday is going to be Father Athanasius' last liturgy last liturgy. So I do recommend if you can make it amp town, make sure you get to church this Sunday because father Athanasius is going to be his last liturgy. He's going to be officially retired and our new priest, father Peter is going to be here. So uh, make sure you can come if you can. And then Harry Serpanos throws in $3 and says DPH, this evil Aussie company is selling Baphomet t-shirts <laughs> and it shows, uh, dangerfield.com.au slash product slash Baphomet t-shirts. I'm not surprised, Harry Serpanos. I'm not surprised. We are in the age of evil. We are in the age of evil, no doubt about that. And then checking the dono chat. We do have a super chat on the dono chat. Paul throws in $10 and says, this is for the Tristana Mental Health Fund. Be supportive of this crucial transition, bigots. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much, Paul, for the $10 super chat. I do appreciate it. And I will make sure it goes to the Tristana Mental Health Fund. Um, thank you so much for that. And Rob throws in $5 and says, great content, bro. I will subscribe to the membership again soon. Oh, uh, Robel. Well, thank you very much, brother. I, I hope that you're doing well. God bless you. Um, I really, really uh, appreciate anybody who goes to the website and signs up, of which, again, we have tons of exclusive video content for anybody who's interested. And so I just want to thank everybody for the support. A major thank you goes to Retro Retrocalypse. Um, and his gifting of 10 memberships, as well as Tommy Jones gifted five Kotal crew memberships. Thank you guys very much. Major thank you goes to Deadpool kid, uh, goes to my tech 23 Marshall law, and we're supposed to be humble and learn. So thank you guys very much for your support as well as blue Skittle, Kristen and Paul. Thank you guys very, very much. Thank you. Harry Serpanos. Thank you. Amp town one. Thank you, Well Emanuel. Thank you, BMX 1966. Thank you, Levy. And that looks like that was all of them. So again, I want to thank you all for the support. God bless you. And I will be back with another stream. The next one's going to be on the CIA secret project of remote viewing, which will be quite interesting. Remote viewing is the idea that people can go into a meditative trance and they can maneuver their consciousness around different parts of the planet and have access to uh, or be privy to exclusive types of knowledge like various nuclear programs. And so we'll be looking at some of those CIA documents and listening to somebody who says that he is trying to become a part of it. This is due to some of the research by a gentleman named Robert Monroe. And so I'll be discussing all of that in the next stream. And then we'll be doing the Freemasonry and, and the revolutionary spirit. So Thank you all so much for the support. I wish you all a blessed New Year's if you don't see me before then. But as always, until next time, God bless.